This is a homily for the Feast of the Ascension of the Lord. The first reading comes from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 24, verses 46 to 53. We have four Gospels, but Luke is the only evangelist to mention the ascension of Jesus. Matthew's Gospel ends with the eleven disciples setting out for Galilee to a mountain where Jesus had arranged to meet them. They received the Great Commission. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe all the commands I gave you. And look, I am with you always, yes, to the end of time. And so ends Matthew's Gospel. But note, Matthew stops short of telling us that Jesus then ascended into heaven. The original ending of Mark's Gospel is set in Jerusalem. Three women, Mary of Magdala, Mary the mother of James and Salome, have brought spices to the tomb so they could anoint the body of Jesus. They're wondering how they're going to roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb. But when they arrive, they see that the stone has already been rolled away. They enter the tomb and see a young man in a white robe who tells them that Jesus has risen. He is no longer in the tomb. The young man, presumably an angel, tells the women to tell Peter and the disciples to return to Galilee where they will see Jesus. But the women were frightened out of their wits and say nothing to anyone. That is the original ending of Mark's Gospel. Again, no account of the Ascension. John's Gospel concludes by the Sea of Tiberias in Galilee, with the risen Lord appearing to the disciples. Once more, there is no account of the Ascension. Only Luke mentions the Ascension, both in his Gospel and at the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles, which is part two of his Gospel. According to his account in the Acts of the Apostles, the Ascension took place somewhere on the Mount of Olives. So let's pause for a moment to see where the Mount of Olives is. Here you can see an aerial photo of modern-day Jerusalem. The blue lines indicate where the walls of the ancient city are located. The Jewish temple destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, was located where the Islamic shrine, the Dome of the Rock, now stands. The arrow to the left indicates the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, built over the site of Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified, and over the tomb of Christ. Note that the walled city was considerably smaller at the time of Jesus. Although the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is now within the walled city, Golgotha and the tomb were located outside the city walls when Jesus was crucified. The Mount of Olives is to the east. Luke tells us in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 12, that it was a Sabbath day's journey. So it's a distance of a little less than a kilometre. Now, if you go to Google Images and type in Ascension of Christ, you'll find any number of images similar to the one that you can see here. Jesus taking off into the clouds from the midst of his disciples. But here is an important question. Was it Luke's intention to give us an eyewitness account of what he actually saw? Is Luke telling us 
that Jesus actually made a vertical takeoff into space. Did it happen something like this? A journey through the skies from earth down here to heaven up there, as though earth and heaven are actually in the same space-time continuum. The Australian biblical scholar, Father Frank Maloney, says this about the ascension of the Lord. It is not the celebration of a physical journey through the skies into heaven. Spectacular and moving, though they may be, we must not allow some artist's impressions of the ascension of Jesus to influence our understanding of this important aspect of our faith. A helpful way to understand what the ascension means is to look at the language that Luke uses. At the end of his gospel, he tells us that Jesus was carried up into heaven. In the Acts of the Apostles, he tells us that Jesus was lifted up while the disciples looked on. However, he then adds an important detail. A cloud took him from their sight. One clue to understanding what Luke is saying is to appreciate the symbolic significance of the cloud. In the Old Testament, the cloud is a symbol of the divine presence. You may recall that during the Exodus, the Lord led the people through the wilderness, going in front of them as a pillar of cloud during the day and as a pillar of fire by night. During the Exodus, the Lord gives his people instructions to erect the tabernacle or tent of meeting. That's the forerunner of the temple that would eventually be built on Mount Moriah. Here in the tent of meeting, God dwelt among his people during their journey into the promised land. In the book of Exodus, we're told that cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled upon it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The tent of meeting, and eventually the temple, was the meeting place of heaven and earth. So when Luke tells us that a cloud took Jesus from their sight, he's not talking about a vertical liftoff into space. He's telling us that Jesus is moving from one dimension of God's creation to another. In other words, heaven is not up there and we on earth down here. Heaven and earth are different or parallel dimensions of God's creation. In the Jewish tradition, the one place where these two parallel dimensions came together was in the temple. The inner sanctum of the temple was known in Hebrew as the Davir, or in English as the Holy of Holies. It was so sacred a place that no one was ever permitted to enter, with the sole exception of the high priest, and then on only one day of the year, the Day of Atonement. Let's consider that idea of two dimensions of reality existing side by side. If you've read any of the Harry Potter novels, or if you've seen the movies, you'll recall what happens when Harry receives the summons to begin his education at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and wizardry. He's taken to London's King's Cross Station, from where he's told the Hogwarts Express departs. But he's confused when he looks at his railway ticket. The train departs from platform nine and three quarters. But when he gets there, he can see quite clearly that there is only a platform nine and a platform 10. There's no platform nine and three quarters. But 
With guidance from the Weasley family, Harry learns what he has to do. He has to run at the brick pillar separating the two platforms and magically he's transported from one dimension to another. From the world of muggles to the world of magic. Two dimensions of reality existing in what seems to be the same place. Consider another example. C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. There are seven volumes in the Chronicles, the first being The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, written in 1948. It tells the story of four siblings, Peter, Susan, Edmund and Lucy, who are evacuated from London to the English countryside in 1940 following the outbreak of World War II. They were sent to a grand old country house owned by an elderly professor. No sooner had the children settled into their new country home than they decide to explore the house. Eventually, they come into a room that was quite empty except for one big wardrobe. There was nothing else in the room. Peter, Susan and Edmund decide to move on, but Lucy stays behind. She thought it would be worthwhile trying the door of the wardrobe, even though she felt almost certain that it would be locked. To her surprise, it opened quite easily. Looking inside, she saw several coats hanging up, mostly long fur coats, and so she steps into the wardrobe leaving the door open. The wardrobe seemed very large inside, and to her surprise, she finds herself rubbing up against the branches of a tree. And then she sees that there's a light ahead of her, where the back of the wardrobe ought to have been. Something cold and soft was falling on her. A moment later, she finds that she's standing in the middle of a wood, which is something of a winter wonderland. Without her knowing it, Lucy has entered the land of Narnia. When Lucy eventually returns to her own world by re-entering the wardrobe, she finds that only a few seconds have passed there during her absence. The wardrobe is the portal between these two worlds, two dimensions of existence. Now, this may be a helpful way of thinking about the ascension. The ascension is a way of saying that Jesus passed from one dimension into another. He is no longer physically present with us, but he is still very close to us. Let me offer another interpretive key to understanding what is happening at the Ascension. Martin Luther offers us a helpful insight in the preface to his German translation of the Pentateuch. He wrote, Here in the Old Testament you will find the swaddling clothes and the manger in which Christ lies. In other words, Jesus can only be fully understood within the context of the Old Testament. Let's see how that applies to the Ascension. Let's go back to the scene of the Transfiguration. Now you may recall that Jesus takes Peter, James and John up a mountain and there in their presence he is transfigured. Appearing with Jesus are Moses and Elijah. The Gospel of Luke has consistently portrayed Jesus as a prophet like Moses and Elijah, but Jesus both follows and surpasses the paths traced out by the great prophets Moses and Elijah. 
Moses led the people from slavery in Egypt, that great journey we call the Exodus. Jesus, through his death and resurrection, leads his people on a far greater and more powerful Exodus, an Exodus from sin and death. But Luke's account of the ascension looks back to the story of Elijah and his departure in a fiery chariot. The story is told in chapter 2 of the second book of Kings. Elijah doesn't die. A chariot of fire appears and horses of fire, and Elijah is taken up into heaven in the whirlwind, while his disciple Elisha and the prophets of Jericho look on. As Elijah is taken up into heaven in the fiery chariot, His mantle falls, and Elisha takes it as his own. The prophets of Jericho exclaim, The spirit of Elijah has settled on Elisha. Elijah's mantle, symbolic of his prophetic role, is now worn by Elisha. And what does Jesus say in today's Gospel? He tells the disciples to remain in the city until they are clothed with the power from on high. Just as Elisha inherited the mantle of Elijah, the disciples of Jesus will likewise be clothed with the power of their Lord after he is taken up into heaven. They are commissioned to complete his work. Let me offer an example of what's happening here. Giacomo Puccini was an Italian composer who's written operas known to all music lovers. A chain smoker of Toscano cigars and cigarettes, he was diagnosed with throat cancer. The radiation treatment he received led to uncontrolled bleeding and he died of a heart attack on November the 29th 1924. He composed such famous operas as Madame Butterfly, La Boheme, and his last opera, unfinished at the time of his death, Turandò. There are, by the way, endless arguments about the pronunciation of the name of this opera, Turandò or Turandot, because the words Persian and in Persian the final T would be sounded, some people opt for Turandot. But since Puccini himself called the work Turando, I'll opt for that pronunciation. The last two scenes of Turando were completed by Franco Alfano, based on Puccini's sketches. The famous conductor, Arturo Toscanini also collaborated with Alfano in the process of completing the opera. Turandò premiered at La Scala on April the 25th, 1926, a year and five months after Puccini's death. The conductor was Arturo Toscanini. When it came to that part of the opera, where Puccini had stopped writing, Toscanini stopped everything. He turned around and addressed the audience. This is where the master ends. And then, after a pause, he raised his baton again and said, and this is where his friends began. And the opera continued. The ascension of the Lord is just that. This is where the Master ends. Now his friends begin.